devastating for a surgeon to be in the operating room and be there doing a procedure that you know is not ideal because you're putting in a piece of metal or plastic that shouldn't really be there. Every day patients are dying because they don't have the right tissue or, or it's, it's quite a tragedy really. Hospital Association has uh, declared this a public health crisis. Tony Atala is a surgeon who implanted the first lab-grown organ and now leads researchers using 3D printing to fight the global crisis of organ shortage. Correct me on some of these statistics if I'm wrong, um, but around 17 people die each day from failure of organ transplant. Does that sound about, about right? Yeah, the numbers are fairly striking, really. You know, when you take a look and see how many lives could be saved just by having enough tissues and organs? Yeah. And the shortage is real. So those numbers are real. Yeah. That sounds, it sounds pretty wild, honestly. 17 a day, I mean, in a, in a year, I don't know exactly the math, but 5,000 plus people. You know, and what uh, we talk about here internally is how, you know, every day patients are dying because they don't have the right tissue or org. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite a tragedy, really. And as you know, the uh, hospital association has uh, declared this a public health crisis. Yeah. Wow. And I mean, your work involves lab-grown organs and tissue. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? what that process and the impact that it's had on uh, healthcare? So basically, the strategy that we use is we uh, try to engineer tissues and organs for different parts of the body. And so uh, the, the main strategy to do that is to take a very small piece of tissue from the patient's mm -hmm. organ of interest. Very small. Less than half the size of a postage stamp. So you can't tell. <laughs> They're, you know, quite tiny. But then we then take that tissue and we can expand those cells outside the body in very large quantities by using special soups, if you will, mm -hmm. that will keep these cells alive. And once we have enough cells for our construct, we can then start building the tissue, you, you know, very much like baking a layer of cake, if you will. Yeah. You're layering the cells one layer at a time. Mm -hmm. And then you put this structure in an oven-like device that has the same conditions as a human body, and they can put it right back into the picture. Mm -hmm. and, and how close are we to... Um, I say we, but like how close are, how close are y'all to actually having an actual organ that you can put into a person? Yeah, so we've been doing this now for a number of years. We uh, placed the first organ in a patient uh, a number of years ago. Mm. Uh, a bladder was the first organ that we implanted. And, uh, and when we did that, uh, you know, the field was still very young, of course, and so we we continue to do that with other tissues, and but the strategy has remained the same. You know, now what has changed is that we can, instead of making these by hand, now we can do other strategies like 3D printing. Yeah. Is that, I guess, assume, um, I assume it makes it quicker to... Yeah, well, 3D printers, you know, we, we really turned our attention to that many years ago. At that time, we already placed tissues and organs into patients with handmade uh, structures mm. and we really wanted to scale the technology up so we started looking at alternative methods and looking at 3d printing where you yeah. can actually print these structures and the printing gives you reproducibility scalability and reduced cost wow so it's effective <laughs> it definitely works <laughs> um what have been some of the most unexpected discoveries that you've that you've seen throughout your years well, you know, the field has really advanced. When we started out, you couldn't even get normal human cells to grow. Most human cells could not be grown or expanded outside the body just 35 years ago. Ooh. And now we can, you know, take a sample of tissue from the patient, we can really get those cells to grow. And a lot of, had, a lot of those advances had to do with growth factor biology and learning what was the soup that was needed to really make the cells grow. So that was some of the advances we've seen, um, you know, just creating tissues, right? That was uh, not possible just a few decades ago. So now we can create tissues and organs using these techniques. Uh, 3D printing, of course, is also a technology we saw evolve. Okay, yeah. And uh, we're seeing much more today. 
many more advances coming down yeah. for the future. And is that like all over the world that you are seeing more and more of this? Or is it kind of very small, like you see it in this region, but maybe not somewhere else? Yeah, it's more the latter, right? If you go into rural areas, of course, you're not going to see these technologies. If you go into many countries that, you know, don't have developed infrastructures, you're not going to see this a lot. Uh, but in fact, there is a growing movement that is global in yeah. terms of making sure that we can get these tissues to patients. And what would you say are some of your, um, or some of the current limitations right now in medicine, whether it be more, I, I don't know how, how much you've grown from being able to print a liver as opposed to like heart, or like are there limitations? Yeah, you know, the number one limit today still remains vascularization or the ability to get blood flow into large solid structures. And that is an area where, again, a lot of progress has been made for sure but still uh, more progress that needs to be made. At True Lion, we're with you at every milestone, and your brightest dreams never have to fade. At True Lion, we help you shine. That's brighter banking. True Lion, Federal Credit Union. What would you say regenerative medicine um, will play in the medicine field in the next five, 10 years? I mean, what, is, what does that look like? So certainly we're going to see an increase in the number of tissues that go into patients. And also we will see uh, larger numbers of patients who can be impacted with these technologies. Does it ever feel like you're carrying a lot on your shoulders because you have been able to accomplish something like this? So it's like you need to keep going in a sense because there's so many people that are relying on something like this. But we're so lucky to have such a great team here at the Institute, you know, over 500 people working together to bring these technologies from the bench to the bedside. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think our team always feels that pressure. You know, we got to get more more done for patients. Um, and I think it's a, a good pressure to have because at the end of the day, the technologies that we're working on, you know, we are inspired by the fact that it's going to impact patients' lives. Mm. And for us, that's why we do this technology. Why, that's why we're working in this area, more, to make patients' lives better. Yeah. And I mean, you you created the first um, 3D bioprinter, correct? Well, we worked extensively in creating uh, uh, better systems of printing for tissues and organs. Mm. I'm sure... Um, like like in any field, you know, you might see failures, especially up front. Um, did that ever get to you uh, whenever you weren't seeing the results that you wanted? Well, you know, I'm a surgeon, you're right? I'm, I'm still practicing. I still see patients. I still do surgery. And so there's nothing more devastating for a surgeon to be in the operating room and be there doing a procedure that you know is not ideal. Because you're putting in a piece of metal or plastic that shouldn't really be there. Wouldn't it be better to use a patient's own tissue to be there? So, of course, we, we do what we need to do. But there's always, a room, you know, there's always room for improvement. And that's really where this field comes in. Can we make the standard better? Yeah. And really, that's the key if, in terms of what inspires us to do what we did. Good book. And I mean, being a surgeon and... Being able to go into a surgery and you change someone's life for the better, you know, you get to see them afterwards, and they're all they're all smiling and being like, "Thank you so much for for everything you did." How do, how does that make you feel? Well, you know, uh, well, I am grateful, very personally grateful for our patients, you know, and uh, and the fact that you know we have the privilege to to go into patients' lives and and to try to impact their health. So I'm um, grateful also for grateful patients, of course. And so, uh, you know, that's why I went into medicine and that's why I still do it, uh, because I really do see that I can, you know, through your daily living, you can make an impact on patients' lives, but 
through research, you can make an impact on many lives, not just that one life that you're we're dealing with at that very moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I mean, you're one of the most influential people in biotech and you have influenced thousands of people, if not millions of people, uh, with, with the work that you're doing and with everything that you are, are accomplishing here. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I'm just really lucky to have a wonderful team and, uh, we just are trying to do our very best just to keep these uh, technologies moving. Yeah. It's very admirable that you you include yourself, the team as well, you know, that, that everyone is a part of it and not um, just side it at all. It's like we're all working together to accomplish the same mission. Yeah, you know, our, um, uh, our mission is to make patients' life better. Our vision is to create a global transformation from treatments to cures. So there's a global aspect to it. But our core values are teamwork, innovation, and integrity. And teamwork because it takes a team to do all these things. And so as we innovate, we want to make sure that we do what's right and create the best technologies for our patients. Mm -hmm.